I'll invite you now to stand with me if you are able for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and all-sufficient word. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament prophet Micah. I'm reading chapter 6 in its entirety, verses 1 through 16. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How, how have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord cries to the city, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear the rod and of him who appointed it. Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore, I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied, and there shall be no, there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away, but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You will sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. For you have kept the statues of Omri, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels, that I may make you a desolation, and your inhabitants a hissing. So you shall bear the scorn of my people. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. How is your Christmas shopping doing? Do you have everybody on your list? You're good? That's amazing. Have you checked your list? Double checked it. Make sure you got everybody. Your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, your pastor, your sister. Oh, <laughs> just kidding. What about God? Is God on your Christmas list for shopping? Almost seems silly to, to conceive or think about a question like that. The psalmist says that God has the cattle on a thousand hills. And Paul reports that God needs nothing that human hands might serve him. So does God even ask of us? Does he require of us anything? Does he want us to give something for Christmas? Would we give something to God? Well, that's the question being posed here in Micah 6. Now, of course, Micah is writing about 800, 700 to 800 years before Jesus was born and so he's not writing in the context of Christmas. He's not thinking of Christmas gifts. But he's thinking about how do we come to God and with what do we come? What do we give to God? What does God want from us, his people? And in that 8th century BC, when Micah is writing, the people have drifted away. They have drifted away from being faithful to the Lord. And they have lost sight of what God desires from his people. Perhaps the best way to kind of think of the relationship between God and his people is that these people have moved from having a covenant relationship with God to having a contract relationship with God. We're all familiar with contracts, right? We might sign a contract with a builder to build our house, 
It's spelled out stipulations. You're going to do this and this and this and this. And we're going to pay you this and this and this. It's going to happen during these hours. All the stipulations are laid out and it's a contract. It's a give and a take. We're trying to you know, benefit both sides. I get something, you get something. We walk away happy. Really, it doesn't have to, you don't <clears throat> give your heart to the plumber who's coming in and redoing your bathroom, right? You don't give your, your heart to the roofer who's coming to redo your roof. You give them your money. You give them your pocketbook. You, you give away that, but you don't fall in love with your plumber, unless your spouse is doing your plumbing. But you don't fall in love with your plumber. That's a contract-based relationship, the give and take, and you got your checklist. This is where Israel was finding themselves in their relationship with God in the 8th century BC and when Micah is writing. They've come to to think of God in this contract basis. What do you want from us? What do we have to do? Let's check it off. God, these are the things we need you to do and take care of. Look, the Assyrian Empire is marching in our land, wants to ransack Jerusalem. Do something about that, God. Look, we have given, you know, burnt offerings, thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil. That's an exaggeration on the writer's part. But we've done this, you do that. It's a contract. And God's responding, saying, That's not the relationship I want with my people. That's not what it is to be in relationship with me. It's about a covenant, a covenant where I have made you promises, a covenant where I laid down my only son to bring you to me, a covenant where I will bring transformation into your life and make you a new person, a covenant where I protect you and provide for you. It's in that relationship, what God wants is you. He wants all of you, your heart. This is why Jesus says in the Gospels, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your strength, with all your soul. Love the Lord with everything who you are. That's what God wants desires. So what kind of relationship do you have with God this morning? A contract or a covenant-based relationship? How do you view God? Is God there just watching you, checking off what you're doing? Or is he this loving Heavenly Father picking you up in his arms and cradling you and carrying you day by day? That's what Micah is presenting for us here in Micah 6. And it's not in that, it almost sounds like a marriage counseling session right there. Let me tell you, marriages go awry when you begin to view it as a contract. But that's a different sermon, different day. We can meet in my office if you want to talk about that. He brings it in the courtroom. You hear the language of a courtroom here right at the beginning. Here. What the Lord says, arise, plead your case. The word case is a legal term for a legal case. He has an indictment against the people of Israel. And so it is a courtroom setting. Perhaps you call it divorce court in that sense. Because the people of Israel have been unfaithful to the Lord. They have fallen into this contract-based relationship with God where they, their hearts have become unfaithful and they've chased after other gods and they've left their first love. And so in the divorce court, God brings his indictment. In verses three through five, you hear God's plea. And his indictment against Israel, very simply, is you have abandoned your first love. Very much like the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2. You have abandoned your first love. God has pursued you, desired to have a relationship with you, and you walk from it. So you hear him recite this several accounts of the works he has done. These are covenant, redemptive, loving works on the half of the people. Verse three, he says, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. He's basically saying, 
why are you bored with me? How, how have I offended you? How, what's, and then he begins in verse four, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, recounting this glorious, incredible story of the Exodus where Israel was away from their, their land. They're being oppressed by the Egyptian authorities in this incredible slavery. And God raises up Moses through miraculous, powerful signs, delivers them, causes Pharaoh's heart to be humbled and broken before him. So he says, go, lead your people away. They go out of Egypt. That is a, a merciful, gracious act of God. He brought you out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of slavery, sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, gives them this leadership to guide them away, to bring them to the promised land. And then verse five, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised. Well, Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Now we're at the end of the 40-year wandering before they go into the promised land, Numbers 22 and 23. And then what happened from Shittim to Gilgal? Shittim is the camp where Israel dwelled on the east side of the Jordan before they crossed the Jordan. Gilgal is the camp where they set up camp on the west side of the Jordan after they crossed the Jordan. And so when he talks about what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, what happened? Well, they crossed the Jordan, sure. But it was an incredible, miraculous work of God to do that. Because in the springtime, when the waters were flooded and the river is overflowing the banks, God stops the water a mile upstream, dries the ground, and millions of people cross this riverbed into the promised land. It was another miraculous, powerful work of God. So this is God's plea with his people, his indictment, saying you have abandoned your first love, God being his first love, their first love. They grew bored with him. They began to look for other things. You see, the problem when you begin to have this contract-based relationship with God, you believe your primary need is direction. Your primary need is information, knowledge. And when that is your primary need, and you say, if I could just learn a little bit more, if just get a little bit more clarity, you eventually get to the place where I don't need God. Because I have other sources of information, other sources of direction, other sources to provide purpose and meaning to my life. That's the contract basis of a relationship with God. Israel, coming out of Egypt, they were in a desperate situation, and they had only God to, to direct them and lead them. But after they got settled in the promised land, how quickly did they forget God? How quickly did they abandon their first love? In a covenant-based relationship with God, you understand that your greatest need is a rescue from your own sinful, rebellious heart. Knowing that my greatest need is that I will wander from you, Lord. So hold me tight. And when you have that understanding, that's your greatest need, you remain right there because God says, I will hold you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand and never let you go. Those are his promises to his people. Would this indictment be appropriate for you? Have you abandoned your first love? Has God become just this distant character, somebody to have a contract with? I'm here at church. I'm doing my duty. God, answer my prayer. Make my life comfortable. But your heart is far from him. Is that where your relationship with God is today? And the Lord in the same manner is, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? I have given you my only son, the precious Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you in your place. Is that boring to you? Has that lost uh, an interest in your heart and your mind? Have you begun to think that you have other needs 
than having the offense of your sin removed from between us so that you could be in a, a loving relationship with me. With what do you come before the Lord? What kind of relationship do you have with him? Well, Micah leads us on into this interaction in the courtroom. What does God require? And so he puts on the lips of a would-be worshiper, someone who is working in this contract-based relationship with God. And he says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God? And he gives these ever-increasing extravagant gifts. It starts in verse 6 with the burnt offerings, with calves a year old. This is extraordinarily expensive. A burnt offering was brought to the, the temple, and it was slaughtered and completely burned on the altar. Nothing was remaining. Now, there are other offerings, like a peace offering or Thanksgiving offering, and only a portion of the animal was burned, and the rest was given back for the family to eat and enjoy. It's kind of like your local barbecue joint. You get some meat. But this is entirely burned up, gone, beyond even what's called a burnt end. It is lost. And a calf, a year old, now think of what's involved. Some of us have had pets, and we know what's involved in that first year of raising a pet. Sleepless nights, messes on the floor, lots of food, the, the efforts, the work, be their calves, don't bring them into the house, but you're raising them, you're feeding them, you're caring for them for an entire year only to be completely burned up and lost. This is an incredibly expensive sacrifice. But then he goes on, verse 7, it's not just these burnt offerings, it's these thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil. Perhaps he's trying to compete with David or Solomon. David had thousands of sacrifices as he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Solomon had thousands of sacrifices as he dedicated the temple in Jerusalem. And it's like, well, is that what we need to be accepted and to be in favor with the Lord? We got to be like David and Solomon and have all these sacrifices. 10,000 rivers of oils is just, like I said earlier, is an exaggeration. Oil was always a company. The sacrifices, it wasn't by itself. And so it's just an extravagant amount. Is that what's needed? And then the third and final is just over the top. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? <clears throat> Micah saw this. This is not hypothetical. For when he began his ministry in the reign of King Ahaz, about 740 B.C., it says in 2 Kings 16, verse 3, the King Ahaz took his son and sacrificed him. Not to the Lord, but to the false god Moloch. There is this, this idea, if I would only sacrifice the most precious thing, then I am going to be accepted. I'm going to be valuable. I'm going to be significant. It's all this contract-based mentality. What should I do? Go to church more? Give more? Read my Bible more? Pray more? Go on a missions trip? What is it, Lord? Serve at a homeless shelter? <coughs> They're all good things, even sacrifices God desired for his people. But the issue is, <clears throat> there's no heart behind this. It's all this contract. You think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 15, when the Pharisees were confronting him about his disciples eating the grain of the field as they're walking by, and he says, this people... I think he says, well, did the prophet say? And the prophet was Isaiah, who would have been buddies with Micah. So Micah perhaps is familiar with this from Isaiah's prophecy. Well, did the prophet say of this people? They honor me with my lips, 
but their hearts are far from me. This is the ongoing indictment of those who want to be on a contract with God. Their heart is far from him. So we come to verse 8. This is the response. What does the Lord require? What does he want? The response says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. This is not new. This is not revelatory. This is not like, oh my gosh, here we are finally in the 8th century BC after hundreds and hundreds of years of being the people of God. Now we know what God requires of us. He says, he has shown you, O man. And you look at Deuteronomy 10, it says, this is what the Lord requires of you. And there it says, to fear the Lord. But here you got different language, right? This verse is placard everywhere at this time. I almost think, let's look at what the verse means. So it says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? What does this mean? To do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. This is, This is how I would summarize what Micah 6, 8 is saying. God wants you to live a life transformed by his astonishing grace, which you know you never deserve. That's what Micah 6, 8 is saying. What does the Lord require of you? To live a life transformed by his astonishing grace, which you know you never, ever deserve. How do I get that from do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God? Look at this. So to do justice, this is a repeated command, a repeated requirement and ask of God's people. Even in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the instructions about justice is primarily for those who are vulnerable. How are we going to care for the vulnerable? the widow, the orphan, the sojourner among us? How are we going to minister to them and meet their needs? Because they are vulnerable because if there was a a famine in the land, they would be the most susceptible to die because they didn't have any kind of resources or sustenance to uphold them. So God provided provisions within the law of how to care for the vulnerable. That's doing justice is caring for the vulnerable and meeting their needs and making sure that they, their life is cared for and sustained. It's part of it. Part of doing justice is being generous. So when you read Job and his plea before his friends in Job 29, he says, my reputation has gone before me in the, in the gate of the city. I have been a father to the fatherless. I have cared for widows. I have given to the people in need. All speaking about the justice that he has sought to do. But the point of all this is, and and this is the nature of a relationship with God, God does not ask his people to do justice in order to have a relationship with him. Here's the checklist, do this, and then I will be your God. That's not how it works. God selected a moon worshiper in Ur of Chaldea, Babylonian era, a moon worshiper. That's what Abram, Abraham was. He was not a God fearer. God took a, an idolater and said, Come, follow me. I have a land for you. And Abram followed him and went into the promised land. And God came to him and said, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to make you a great nation. Look at the stars of the heavens. If you could count them, that's how many children I'm going to give you. Abram had no children at that moment. And it says, Abram believed God, and God accepted him as righteous. What did Abram do? Nothing. God initiated. God called him. God brought him to himself. And then God says, I'm going to seal my promise for you. And this is how you seal promises in that culture. You kill animals. 
And then you walk in between the animals and saying, if I fail any part of my side of this promise, my contract, you could call it a contract. So when, today we signed the dotted line. I'm giving myself there. They said, cut the animals. Well, let's walk through the animals. And if I fail, let me be like these dead animals. If you fail, let you be like these dead animals. God has Abram cut these animals, lay them out on the ground, and then God puts Abram to sleep. And while Abram is sleeping, he sees this vision of a smoking furnace and the imagery of God come and walk through the animals by himself and declare the promises to Abram, I will make you a great nation. And through you, I will bless all the nations of this world. This is God's covenant promises to Abram. And God says, it all rests on me. That's that covenant relationship. God says, I'm going to do it. And the rest of the story here in the Old Testament is God building up Abram and his children into this nation who is serving as an incubator, so to speak, for the promised one to come who will bless all the nations. God is upholding his promises. What is Christmas? Christmas is a celebration that God keeps promises. Christmas is a, a yes to the promise of Eve in the Garden of Eden saying, your descendant is going to crush the head of the serpent. Christmas is a yes to the promise to Abram, I will bless you and make you a great nation and through you, I'll bless all the nations. Christmas is a, prom, a yes to the promises to Moses saying, I will raise up one like you, Moses, who is a prophet like you, who will speak on my behalf to teach the people who I am. Christmas is a yes to the promise to David saying, I will raise up one of your descendants to be a king forever on my throne and he will rule with righteousness and justice forever. Christmas is the yes to the promise to Jeremiah saying, you can't do this on your own. You need transformation. And I will do it through a new covenant, a renewed covenant, through my son. What does all this have to do with doing justice? You and I never do justice like God requires or asks of us to do justice unless we are being transformed by him and his covenant promises. That, that call to do justice is a reminder, you got to be tapped into me, in a relationship with me. For I am the first and the foremost who does justice, and I will make you my agents of justice in this world if you're connected to me. So that's why I say... Micah 6 eight is a call to live a transformed life by his astonishing grace. We do justice only when we're transformed by his astonishing grace. Now, where does astonishing grace come in this verse, Micah 6 eight? Well, the second phrase, love kindness. I have a bone to pick with the translator. My, my copy has a footnote next to it, Kindness. Look at the footnote below. It says steadfast love. It's my favorite Hebrew word. Don't mess with my favorite. Hebrew word. Chesed. I just like saying it. Chesed. This guttural CH at the beginning. Chesed. It's used some 200 times in the Old Testament. 95% of the time, it speaks about God's covenantal, faithful, never failing, always and forever love for his people. You know your favorite psalm to read and skip half the line, Psalm 136? To the King of kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. To the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Da da da, for his steadfast love. You know it. You know you read that and skip half the lines. That is a psalm celebrating chesed. We, we heard it in Exodus 34 when God is going to reveal his glory. The Lord, the Lord, a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in chesed. 
That's his steadfast love, his committed love, his never failing, never giving up, always and forever love. And so here in Micah 6 8, it says, do justice and love love. It's two different words in Hebrew. One is delight in, enjoy, revel in, rest in, steadfast love. Now there's a vertical aspect to it and a horizontal aspect to loving love. The vertical aspect is saying, God, there is nothing better than your love for me. There is nothing better better. I think it's Psalm 62 that says that. Better than life is your steadfast love. There is God's committed, never failing, always and forever love that cradles us, upholds us, knows that time and time and time again, we do not do justice. There's no one who is ever going to be perfect Justice warrior, I know that's a trigger word, sorry, I don't mean to trigger people. But we're all going to fail, we're all going to fall short, we're not going to do justice. So in our efforts to be like God and doing justice, we are clinging to, reveling in, loving his steadfast love because it's his steadfast love that removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. It's his steadfast love that is celebrated at Christmas that brings us into a right relationship with God. That's that vertical aspect of it. We need his love, the horizontal aspect. God does want us to be like him in our love for others. And this love is a compassionate, forgiving, gracious, long-suffering, tender-hearted love for others. You see, if we have this contract basis relationship with God, we're not reveling in the love of God, we could begin to get a little cocky with ourselves saying, look at what I've done. They're not doing it. They're not doing enough. I'm better. I'm, I'm going up the ladder. That, that's the problem with that contract. When we have this covenantal relationship with God, we are always reveling in the steadfast love of God, realizing it's only his love. It's only his grace. It's only his mercy that... I am who I am. So who am I to judge another person? Who am I to look down on someone else? Who am I to condemn? And that's that horizontal aspect. This is where Paul is able to say it in Ephesians 4, 32, after he says, put away all slander and malice and hatred and anger and wrath and clamor and things like that. It says, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. That is, like a 6 eight, love, love. And walk humbly with your God. This is where I said, God requires of us to live a transformed life by the astonishing grace of God, which we know all too well we don't deserve. So what it means to walk humbly with your God every day. I don't deserve this. I don't, I don't earn this. I didn't achieve this. This is the free blessing gift of God for me. That's that humbly. Humility is essential. In our relationship with God and our love for other people. This is what God wants. We have to hear Micah 6, 8 in that context of a covenant. This is what God is desiring. This is what Micah 6 is all about. He's coming to his people and saying, where have we gone astray? Where where are we going to get off track? It's not about a contract. It's about this covenant, a covenant where I have laid down the life of my son for you. Where are we? Rest in that, revel in that, enjoy that, and allow this to transform you to to be a new person. The rest of the chapter, Micah turns to the covenant curses. Many of these are being repeated from Deuteronomy 28. 
Deuteronomy 28 outlines the blessings and curses of the covenant relationship with God. If you remain faithful in that relationship with God, giving your heart to the Lord, resting in, reveling in his chesed for you, there are covenant blessings. But if you are going to wander and drift and fall into this contract relationship with God, there's curses. Because the reality is, if you are in a contract relationship with God, you have no relationship with God. You are far from Him. And being far from God is in a place of darkness, a place of judgment. And that's what Micah is outlining here. Confronting the the injustices of these people, their wicked scales, their deceitful weights. They were cheating people, stealing money. He says that they're going to not be satisfied. And these are the covenant curses. They'll eat but not be satisfied. They will put away but not preserve. They will sow but not reap. They will tread olives but not have oil. They'll tread grapes. Basically, the fertility of effort and work. If you want to work for your relationship with God, fine, go ahead. Work for your relationship with God. The end, though, is completely empty. That's the end. But the blessings, he unpacks in chapter 7. And we'll save that for next week. Got to come back. The blessings, let me summarize the blessings. I'll use the words of Paul. I, I, I marvel at these every time I think about them. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is just celebrating God. He, he opens most of his letters with a praise to God. And he opens Ephesians with this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us that we might be adopted as his sons according to his grace, which he lavished upon us. In him, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Those are the covenant blessings every spiritual blessing, being part of the people of God, being a child of God whom he loves, the redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. It's, I think of Paul in Romans 8.32, and I think this is an echo of Micah 6. He who did not withhold his only son for you, how will he not with him give you all things. That's the promise. God has given you Jesus. How will he not also with him give you all things? The blessings flow upon one another in that covenant relationship with God. So with what are you coming to the Lord this Christmas? Are you in that contract relationship thinking about your check marks or are you in this covenant relationship coming with your heart to rest in his faithful love? Let me pray for us. Gracious God, thank you for your kindness in making clear to us what you do ask of your people. And you do not ask us to do anything that's beyond our ability because you know everything is beyond our ability. You ask us to come and rest in your great accomplishment, the gift of Christ. So Lord, may we even now rest in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.